we all came up with a really uh, fun idea of how two girls in the New Mexico desert who get hired to go on this geocache treasure hunt adventure and things get a little crazy. Um, so pretty much uh, we, we uh, got my, everyone who worked on this film obviously worked for free. It was a co-op, but we kind of pitched it to everybody that this is a co-op. Everybody owns the movie. We will never sell it to a distribution company and whatever money we get back will come back to the entire team, which if anyone here is sold to a distribution company, you know that getting you know, back end is almost impossible. So this was desirable to everyone, I think, because we knew we would finish it and we could get it out there. Mostly when I come out and talk about this project, people want to know, like, gosh, your restrictions. How do you deal with your restrictions, your restrictions? For us, it wasn't that. We, instead, we, if, if you focus on restrictions, you're basically just going to bury yourself. you, you got to focus more on what you do have, uh, which wasn't much. Uh, Except the New Mexico desert. The New Mexico desert. That, that was, was a great location. <laughs> by far the third star of this movie. Yeah. Um, so we did what we could. Um, John had so no NDs horrible. for his lenses. Do you think that uh, so with the Sony A7S right? shooting yeah. S-Log2, you're limited to 1600 ISO in exterior day in the New Mexican desert. Uh, so we dealt with it. John, who's the director, he actually ran sound, location sound. He ran it. We had two lobs on and he ran the, the boom. So it was just Rick behind, I wish we had the picture of Rick behind the camera and John holding the boom and that's it. <laughs> Once we shot the 12 days, we did come back to Los Angeles and we shot the opening scene with Jeff Schroeder. He's a good friend of ours. He's a, he has a huge, massive following because he was on Big Brother and he's the host of Daily Blast Live. And we asked him if he would be in our film because we need some sort of person to be able to help us promote this when you don't have a distribution company's money behind it. It was a 1,000 on set to make the movie. By the time we were done filming, I think we were at like $980 to actually shoot the movie. But then to go into post and do distribute, now we're up to 5,000. Total's 5,000. 5,000 including that 1,000, yeah, to pay for distributor, to pay for the poster. We actually spent the same amount of money on the film as we did on our poster. Because being through, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, because being through the process of uh, distributing, I know what sells and how it sells. So your poster is actually one of the most important parts of your film because it is the gateway between you and your audience. It's, if you're going through Netflix or Redbox, it's the only thing you're going to see that's going to entice you to either watch the trailer or buy the film. So we actually decided we were going to put a lot of money into that poster so that people would be intrigued. We did assemble the team ahead of time too because we did the points breakdown ahead of time. So we, are, we offered out how the points was going to break down in ownership of it. So you have to probably do that ahead of time because you don't want to get stuck in post-production being like, oh, I gave all my points away. I have no points to offer somebody in post. So we, when we came up with this idea that we wanted to make this film, we did a spreadsheet and offered points out to everybody and then they came on and said, yeah, I'll do it. Since we self-distributed, we didn't have like a deadline per se, but we were always hoping that, it's hard when you're not paying people to put them under a deadline because everybody's doing it on their own time. Uh, but we, our editor's name is Lex Benedict, and she did an incredible job, and she worked really fast, and she was really excited about it. I think one other thing um, that helped us get our post people on was we allow people to be really creative in our films. Like, we're not, we're not, like, super, like, oh, like, John doesn't sit in the editing room and be like, it has to be like this. We actually handed her the hard drive and said, go for it, and she was like, no one ever lets me just get to play and be creative. That's worth its weight in gold for me that I get to like do it. So we, and we did that with the, uh, Sean, who was our uh, composer. We said, go for it. Just watch the film and you bring life to the music. And so I think that'll help a lot too if you let people be creative. Pretty much every night uh, <laughs> the script went through revisions uh, based on what we had shot earlier yep. and what we could still make room for. Yeah. Uh, I, again, the elements, uh, even the sun setting, <laughs> sometimes helped with uh, changing the script around a little bit. Yeah, we're really flexible on the script. You have to be. You have to be willing to rewrite it right there and be like, that's not going to work. Or that night being like, oh, that's not going to work anymore because of what we shot today. Let's switch that. Like so, yeah. But the good news is this whole crew, including the, the acting talent, the, the process in itself was just very uh, uh, improv. Um, a lot of times it was, how about I say this line? How about I climb to the top of this mountain and do this shot? 
Uh, it's just we go with having it. fun. Having fun. Go with the flow. I mean, we do that even on our films that have investors and stuff. Sometimes on the day we will write it, but we own the script, so we can do that. I recommend if you're doing this process to own that script and not have to worry about sticking to it, because you can't. You're going to have to be able to be change it on a dime, and sometimes happy accidents become the best part of your film. So we're very open to going with something if it's going to work better. When we make something, our next goal is to make money. So if you're flying yourself to a film festival and begging everyone at the film festival to come see your movie, that's not going to put money in your pocket. So we are actually more interested in getting these movies out there where people can buy them and then the revenue stream comes back. So for self-distribution, we hired a company called Distriber. There's a couple different companies that will act as your aggregator. Distriber is the company we worked with. There's also a company called Juice. I'm sure they're going to be popping up left and right as people are going to be doing this themselves. Um, and then, of course, for an aggregator, you pay them up front. And then what they do is they put your films on the platforms that you want. And then once your movie's up there, they step back and the rev revenue stream comes directly to you. So it's like the opposite of a distribution company who should pay you up front for your movie. And then they're going to front all the costs and then they're going to take a huge chunk of it before you ever see any money through the revenue stream. For Amazon, you need three pieces of key art and closed captioning. But we chose not to do it ourselves on Amazon just because we've all been through this process. <laughs> We're like, we'll just pay someone to do it for us. Um, and we chose iTunes and Amazon, and, and maybe we'll end up going to other platforms in the future. But right now, one of our strategies, we also have a social media star named Chelsea Crockett in the film. So we kind of had a strategy and all of this is kind of guessing because we're all just testing the self-distribution market. But we chose, we heard that iTunes actually likes to be exclusive. If they find out that your, your movie is exclusively on their platform, they're more likely to promote you. Whereas like Amazon does not care because they own the world and everyone and they don't care. If, and they also sell every, uh, lots of other things besides movies, but iTunes is movies exclusive. So they actually like that. Plus we were thinking if you have a social media star in your film, and they're going to promote it on their, on their Instagram or Twitter or whatever, would you, we didn't want to split their audience to Amazon to I, and iTunes. We wanted them to drive their, all their audience to one place to hope to get the numbers high so that therefore iTunes would start promoting you. We did, at your own risk, did land at number six on the pre-orders um, for iTunes, which is huge, uh, because we were on the home page if you went there. And that's a lot of probably the work that we did in press releases and getting the word out there. Netflix and Hulu are licensed deals, so you don't get a pay-per-view. They just license your movie and then they have it. Like we, our movie Catching Faith licensed to Netflix for two years for $75,000. So whether five million people watch it or one, that's all you see. So um, that's where it becomes a pitch because you're not, there is no revenue stream coming back to you. But iTunes, I mean, and, they, and also um, if you don't get accepted for some reason to iTunes, uh, you're, they will give you, Disper gives you your money back. They take a percentage, but they give you the mo most of it back. But this movie was a test. We want to learn self-distribution. When you sell to a distribution company, you don't get the analytics from your movie. You have no idea who's buying it, where they're buying it. Um, so you can't even market it back out. You don't know. So that's something we want to learn. Like, I want to know what part of the country or what part of a, I mean, all now iTunes and Amazon is all over the world. So I want to know. Like, we just had a sale in London. Cool. We know we sold in London. And maybe we'll do some Instagram that would target where it is. But a distribution company doesn't share that information with you. So for us, this was a learning process. We want to learn. This isn't our first time doing it. We know kind of what to expect and we know what the deliverables look like. And that is something that you, you know, if you got to the end of your film and you got to that place, you could be very overwhelmed or be like, oh my gosh, I can't even finish this. But that's the same when a distribution company buys your film and they send you the list of deliverables. That can stop some independent filmmakers from even finishing their film because there's so many um, things that can be very overwhelming. But we, hit, we already kind of knew like all the aspect ratios and the stuff that you have to deliver. I do all the press releases anyway, and I've done a lot of the marketing for my movies because who's going to market your movie more than you are? And watching all that revenue stream go to a distribution company can be so disheartening. So it's nice to know that as much how hard I work for this movie, every dollar that comes back comes back to us. And so I, we did, uh, Helen and I did press releases. We have been going out there asking people to review it. I just got a review out of Australia. And then just kind of, you know, just 
ask everybody, because reviews are really like having like reviewers, like I just got rejected by Variety Magazine, but Movie Maker Magazine loved our story and they put the story in Movie Maker Magazine. So anything that you can do to get a little bit of reviews out there is, it. but we're doing that all of ourselves. We didn't hire a company. This was a whole fun experiment of doing it differently, you know? It was a blast. We had a great time. Thank you guys. <laughs> That's why we so do much. this, right? Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.